Well, hello everyone. Good morning, good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. And welcome to this WFA and Dentsu Schema webinar on marketing transformation, delivering the future fit organization. Now, uh, thank, thank you all very much for joining on time. We will take no more than one hour for this session and the session will be recorded. So that will be made available to you after the session. We will also distribute this presentation in addition to the, um, the report that we're going to be walking you through today. So all of that will become available to you at the end of the session. Now, um, quick introductions. My name is Matt, I'm in the middle and um, my colleagues, Hannah and Joanna are part of the team that's delivered this webinar today. Hannah's the, 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 the person who's sort of enabling this this webinar for us and joanna has been delivering the report we're going to walk through however the star of the show is nick broomfield who is executive director and global client lead at dentsu schema um, nick is an old friend of the wfa uh, you might know his organization better as the customer framework which was the name they were called before they were recently acquired by dentsu um, dentsu schema is a strategic partner of the wfa within the the arena of marketing transformation. So we're going to be handing over to Nick shortly, who's going to walk us through this really interesting seminal, I might say, report on marketing transformation. Before we do, um, some quick background from me. Many of you will know that WFA has two types of member. We have uh, 60 national advertiser associations, and many of those are joining our meeting today, including members from uh, Union de Marque in France, OVM in Germany, and many others besides. So welcome to you if you're from one of those associations or if you're a member of one of those associations. Now, there is also another type of member, our corporate members, of which there are something like 125 right now and many new members joining in 2020 as well. So welcome to you if you are a new or an old member and welcome to you if you are an, an association member as well. So to the topic of the day, we're talking about marketing transformation today. And this is something which we've been looking at uh, for some years actually throughout the various um, communities that WFA facilitates. So this has taken shape in various forms, like in meetings, you can see on the right where we've been workshopping and discussing, focusing on the challenges you have within the area of transformation. And indeed within our written work as well, and there's various reports we've published on the progress that you've all been making with your media or marketing transformation programs. So it's, it's all been part of um, uh, a steady progress, steady drumbeat we've been beating towards, uh, towards what we would like to look at today. Uh, because we observe that this is still a high priority for many of you. And here's a comment from our recent priorities research, which identified from a member that their number one priority in 2021 is to build a responsive digital culture that can accelerate marketing transformation. So it's still a high priority. And that is why we've been focusing on producing this new report because we observe that while many organizations know what they have to do, they don't necessarily know how to actually put in place the change. And this report is designed to help you with that. So it's a report loaded with recommendations, but based on the responses from 60 or so members across 51 organizations. Now, all the respondents to this were in very senior marketing roles uh, with 63% in global roles, the, the split was something like 50-50 between those in marketing and media roles, so quite an interesting spread between disciplines as well. Now, in addition to the quant work, we also did some qualitative interviews with some CMOs, and you'll notice a number of quotes from those CMOs throughout our report. So it's a, it's a document which has got really wide inputs from a, a really broad base of members. And we think it's really it's loaded with really useful stuff. Now you can find um, a number of recommendations in this report. There are three main chapters on delivering transformation, leadership, people and culture, organization, structure and ways of working and data and technology. 
And within each of these, there are a number of recommendations, as you can see, and there is also a, a decent chapter on barriers to change. So we are confident that this will really help you accelerate your transformation. That's certainly what the intention is. So what I'm going, now going to do is, is hand over to Nick, who's going to walk us through the findings in more detail. But just before I do, just to sort of wake you up and, and uh, encourage interactivity, what we'd like to do is launch a quick poll amongst you guys here. What we'd like to know from you, everyone on the call today, is where you are up to on your transformation journey. Right, very interesting indeed. Half of you, just under half of you, have said you're taking your first steps. 34% progressing well, very good. We do have 3% of respondents, of, of people on this call today, who are world-class. Good for you, that's really great. Okay, thank you very much for that. What we're going to do now is hand over to Nick, who is going to compare and contrast those results with what we found in our report, because we actually asked the same question. Over to you. Hi, Matt. Great. Uh, just a very quick warm welcome from myself as well. Thank you for the introduction, Matt. Uh, it's great to be here and to be sharing some of the insights and recommendations that we have from um, the report. Um, pretty close in terms of our uh, first slide here, in terms of how you guys compare to the report itself. Um, we had 47 first steps and 34 progressing well. Um, and we have 37 in our report and 32% progressing well. So fairly similar, um, a third to a half are really still taking those first steps on that transformation journey. Um, we had 9% well advanced this morning. Um, in the report, we had a slightly higher proportion at 22% um, and a very similar proportion of world class. It's, it's very low. 3% uh, this morning, 2% in our report. So there hopefully is lots for everyone to learn from what we're going to cover off today. Um, in the report, we asked the question, uh, please give an indication of your, your maturity in comparison to what we defined as the ideal transformed organisation. And that's not an easy thing to put into um, a, a punchy sentence, but the sorts of things we were talking about when we think about mature, advanced, uh, is a business that has agile ways of working. It's enabled by tech, but focused on capabilities, flexible and collaborative um, ways of working through an operating model that is driving uh, the ability to prove sustainable incremental profitability. And these are all topics that we're going to touch on um, in different levels of depth this morning and that are covered in a lot more depth in the main report. Um, what we've done in the presentation and report is split those five stages down into three um, section three stages, if you like, of maturity. Early stage, which covers those starting and taking the first steps. Developing, which is covering those that are progressing well. Um, and then we've put the well advanced and world class into our advanced category. So three sections to cover off. The first one is leadership, people and culture. Um, the first question we asked here was looking at the extent to which um, respondents agreed that they had full recognition at the executive level, and that was wider than just the marketing function, of a clear and commercial need to fundamentally transform marketing. For us, the need to ensure that you are engaging and mobilizing active C-suite support for your transformation program is the number one foundation stone for driving successful transformation. Encouragingly, compared to the reports that we've done with the WFA in 2015 and 2018, we actually see a fairly high proportion across the board of respondents agreeing. However, we see here 79% of advanced, nearly 80% strongly agreeing that they have that C-suite support and recognition. And that's versus just 27% of those at the early stage. So you can really see here how it's super important to ensure that you put the time and effort up front in ensuring that your leadership team are fully aligned behind the common vision. Um, I'm going to be talking about a number of quotes from the CMO interviews that we held as part of the project this morning too. Um, and you'll see one here from Juan Manuel Hoyos, who's the uh, global GM at Nissan. 
And he talked about the most successful transformation plans need all people. And those were his emphasis, all people engaged across the organization, driven by strong leadership with clear KPIs and success measures. So you can see here, it's really important we have this as a foundation stone. Um, another quote that came from Jody Harris, who is Global VP at AB InBev, was also very pertinent, you'll see in the report. Um, and she said that the number one success factor in her business, in her opinion, was to have a clear unifying vision throughout the organization that acts as a rallying cry for change. So really important foundation. We'll move on to the next slide. And this is interesting uh, as a point tied into that first idea. Um, and we found here, we looked at the question, to what extent do executive leadership view marketing as a proven driver of growth? And indeed marketing budgets as an investment uh, in the success of the business. Um, some businesses are still seeing marketing, sadly, uh, as a, a cost center. What we want is that um, it's clear where advanced organizations are focused is seeing marketing as a growth driver. 43% um, strongly agreeing with that statement versus just 15% of those at the early stage. So very important um, to be driving the success of marketing as a driver of growth so um, we can drive that program of change. Uh, Paul Bennett, a uh, quote here from who's Global Brand Director at AXA, talked about how marketing should be the function that leads the transformation program in the business, as then we're guaranteeing that the change is customer or consumer led. So a good point there from Paul Bennett. Now, following on from the recent WFA report called The Marketer of the Future, we can see that investing in the right skills was a critical focus area for businesses. Having the right skills and the right capabilities internally will be critical to driving successful change. Um, we asked the question, to what extent does your organization possess the skills and the talent? That was the right number with the right skills to make a success of your transformation vision. And you see here quite a startling difference between advanced and early stage, where advanced have 58% who significantly agree, and then another 33% moderately agreeing that they have the skills in place. That compared to only 4% of early stage and 12% of developing who were able to say that they significantly agreed they had the talent in place. So this is a real important focus area. Um, it's going to be a mixture, in our opinion, of balancing recruitment of the right people um, in alongside dedicated and focused training of your people in the areas of digital marketing, change management, data-driven marketing, uh, and so forth. Um, great quote here from uh, Zina uh, Srivatsa Arnold, who's the global CMO at Kimberly Clark. And she talks here about organizations need a greater focus on real time marketing skills um, and what she called more hands on the keyboard skill sets, um, a phrase that um, uh, also is talked about by Mark Pritchard, um, the global marketer of the year for last year, um, who talked about hands on the keyboards, a far more emphasis on actually marketers doing a lot of the digital activities themselves internally. And we'll come on to talk about in-housing shortly. Um, in the report, uh, I won't cover it fully here, but in the report, we also have a question that looked at the capacity for change within our teams in marketing. So it's, it's critical to have the right skills and capabilities, but then freeing up people to have the capacity to actually put the skills into practice through dedicated roles, COEs, et cetera, is also key. Um, advanced organizations reported 50% of their people having a real focus on capacity, strongly agreeing, versus just 13% of those at the early stage. So skills important, but also giving people the capacity to change as well. Before we move on to talk about org structure and ways of working, we wanted to share this slide as we felt it was very interesting to think about how the marketing function is evolving or will evolve over time. And the question we asked was which activities currently sit within your marketing function? 
um, in 2020, 2021. And which of these areas or activities do you expect to be managed by marketing by the year 2023? Um, and what we saw was a very interesting um, view of three or four areas that were showing a marked increase in shifting or being led through the marketing function specifically. The first one uh, was customer experience management. Um, and we're seeing a real increase in the number of briefs that we're getting and the number of projects we're delivering around customer experience transformation, really focusing on an integrated and omni-channel experience across the path to purchase. Whether you see that path to purchase as a funnel or a figure of eight, doesn't really matter, um, as long as we are starting to think about really understanding every stage of that path um, and thinking about how can we make it more relevant and joined up for the customer. And increasingly, this is something that marketing are taking um, and leading. Um, alongside, interestingly, the next area, which is customer data strategy. And we saw a huge increase here from 49% to 74%, um, suggesting, of course, that to deliver that customer experience and make it personalized and relevant and individualized, data will be what is um, the, the key asset to do that. So we're seeing a real focus um, away from um, an IT-led topic with regards to data, more into the marketing function. So um, a key area for skills uh, to be ramped up. Um, not surprisingly, perhaps, with the pandemic that we find ourselves in, um, e-commerce was radically accelerated last year and will continue to be this year. But we noticed here a 12% um, increase in e-com moving into marketing. Right now, it can often sit within the sales function, or in the packaged goods industry within the shopper marketing function, we're seeing a real focus in e-com moving strongly into the, the marketing team. And that's um, a mixture of focus and strategies around direct to, direct to customer, but also relationships with e-tailers and grocers. Um, and we're seeing a lot more focus on an execution level now looking at how advertising, digital advertising, is driving far greater focus on conversion, um, uh, whether it's click to buy, add to basket. We're seeing more briefs focusing on commercial objectives than just brand building um, or digital objectives, which is good. Um, perhaps that's then linked to the last one here you see, which is sales channel planning, um, also taking a significant increase, almost doubling, as we see sales channel planning moving into the marketing team. Um, interestingly, we felt with all of the commentary from Professor Mark Ritson around marketing's focus on the four P's, um, we don't see a massive increase in NPD or indeed pricing coming into marketing. But over time, we think that as the function becomes more strategic, that will start to increase as well. So we'll move now into organisation structure and ways of work. Um, the first one, and perhaps the most important one, is focusing on um, the fact that legacy operating models can very much um, inhibit your ability to transform your business. We looked at a question here, um, which was, um, to what extent the current marketing operating model and structure inhibits your ability to succeed in the digital economy? And the numbers here are the percentage who agreed or completely agreed with that comment. So worryingly, 92% of early stage organisations were saying that they agreed their um, operating model and structure inhibits their ability, compared to 50% of advanced. Um, still fairly high, but nowhere near as high as the, the 92%. So what's critical is that organizations need to start making sure that they view digital as a mindset um, relevant for every single person in the business, particularly in marketing, not just um, as a center of excellence that sits to the side of the function. So this is a really important point. And a lot of the work we do um, on transformation programs is focusing first and foremost on the alignment, as I've talked about, for leadership teams, but then looking at the operating model, trying to drive more agile ways of working into a traditional structure um, often fails um, and is difficult to uh, make work. 
Um, also, we asked a question in the report, which you can see uh, in more detail later. We asked about the percentage of businesses that treat marketing transformation and digital transformation as a single program. To what extent is it a single program? Um, and we found that 80% of advanced organizations make no separate uh, distinction between the two. Um, but 54% um, of early stage still have them separated. Um, and the separation can lead to multiple and differing objectives for how the digital, digital COE and the marketing function are operating. So we would very much recommend that those were one and the same uh, things. Um, there's a lovely quote from Juan Manuel Hoyos from Nissan, who said that that separation he felt was old school thinking. Um, and I love the quote here from Steve Axe, who's the CMO at Nomad. And he suggested that it's always good to encourage a healthy dissatisfaction with the status quo and believe we can do better. So thinking about the operating model and how that needs to change will be key going forward. The next area for organization structure and the next recommendation is really around the need to centralize key parts of the transformation strategy. Um, this is important point. And we touch in the report a lot more around global to local. Um, the question here was focusing on marketing strategy is defined and all decisions about transformation are taken centrally. Now, of course, some businesses um, quite rightly have a decentralized model, um, but a lot of global businesses are increasingly seeing key parts of their transformation program run from the center. Um, and we see in the numbers here, 72% of advanced are agreeing that some level of their program is centralized versus just 42% of the early stage organizations. Um, in our experience, it's areas such as technology where we can see some real benefits um, in driving some centralization. Um, one of our clients in the packaged goods industry has a lovely model which they called fix, flex and free when it comes to technology. Some solutions are fixed globally for example, uh, the ad server is a consolidated solution. Some other solutions, they have flexibility in the markets to work with potentially um, their own vendor, but there's a roster of vendors that can be driven from the center. And then free is where very occasionally there are some tools that are totally up to the markets to choose what they need to locally. Um, also, you'll see in the report a question around what we call a managed approach to learning. And this for us is an area where we'd very much recommend a centralized approach to um, what is being tested and what is being learned so that you as an organization reuse successes, um, but obviously limit um, reuse of failures and um, learnings that didn't work. So freedom within a framework, in our opinion, and from the research is the model that is most likely to succeed. Now, bear with me on this chart. This is a little bit detailed, so I'll take you through it um, line by line. This is then looking at um, the topic of in-housing, which is a very topical um, area of conversation right now. We're asked about this all the time, and we're obviously seeing lots of businesses moving into an in-house model. The recommendation from the insights in this report are that it needs to be done in a very um, strategic and careful way over time. Now, the chart, the boxes, I'd like you to look at the blue boxes to begin with. In the blue boxes, we're looking really at the early stage and the, the developing organizations, um, the pink and the red bars. And you can see here, these are the highest areas uh, for those pink and red organizations. This is where we're focusing on data management, on analytics, and on customer insight. Um, not surprisingly, these are the areas where businesses tend to first focus when they want to in-house. They're taking their data strategy, their analytics uh, function in-house as the priority, which makes a lot of sense. Um, these are strategic assets to have within your own control, not with your agency partners. If we then build, and you see here the focus on um, the more advanced organizations, the black bars, where they are stronger, 
it tends to be in the areas that are focusing more on execution. So if you look on the left, um, you see here digital strategy and tech, but also you see social media management at 83%. Um, over the, in the middle to the right, you see digital media buying and digital media planning and even search um, way, way higher than those developing and early stage organizations. So as maturity increases, we're seeing a far greater focus on execution of digital marketing tactics being in-house. Um, interestingly, we found that creative and content production, um, perhaps controversially compared to some other reports that are out there at the moment, we found that they weren't heavily in-house just at the moment, particularly by advanced organizations. So um, I think there's still some work to be done to see how the creative side of, of marketing is being in-house or not uh, by businesses. But certainly on the digital and the media side, as you mature, execution is moving in-house. Great quote here from Richard Kanalik, who heads programmatic at Vodafone, who said, um, advertisers can underestimate what's required to bring programmatic in-house, um, hence what he calls a hybrid model. Um, and in our experience, we're seeing the hybrid model tending to be how that balance is being struck in terms of what is in-house and what stays with agency partners. Um, we're working with one client at the moment uh, who have very interesting model. They have seven factors that they call the must-haves, which are needing to be ticked before the uh, market can move to an in-house model. These are things like senior management support, the right capability in place, the right level of budget in place. Um, once those must-haves are ticked, the markets can then move into a three-stage hybrid model from basic into one which might be just some in-housing uh, data and maybe social execution, mature where they might be in-housing search and to some extent programmatic, and then finally full in-house. But it's only the most mature markets that would be moving to a full in-house model up front. Uh, final point you'll also see in the report, we looked at the proportion that uh, organizations were benefiting from in-house. And encouragingly, we saw 75% of businesses were seeing some benefit from in-housing. But at this stage uh, in 2021, around only 20% were seeing um, the full, uh, complete benefit of the vision they had for in-housing. So there's still some space uh, to go to crack what in-housing is right for each business. The next area um, was just to cover off the area of why are we driving an in-house model? And this was interesting. We found here, again, if you look at the gray and the red, the early stage and the developing, um, it is about ownership of the data asset for those that are starting off on their in-housing journey. 83% um, and 80% of early stage and developing, it was about the data um, asset ownership. As maturity drives up um, in the developing here, you see cost saving was becoming a really important objective for the in-house journey. But if we look at the um, bars on the left for the advanced organizations, what we see as in-housing goes to the end level and the full maturity, it's very much more about driving improved agility and increased control over the processes within marketing. Um, and as Juan Manuel Hoyos says here again, very eloquently, having cost savings as your primary objective will not deliver competitive advantage. Um, it's the focus on agility that will do, and that will then turn ultimately into the significant cost savings that we hope to see. Uh, the fifth area in org structure and ways of working was um, the need to start to review and re-engineer some of the critical processes that exist within marketing. Um, again, this was quite a marked difference between advanced and early stage. We asked the question, to what extent does your organization possess the processes that are needed to make a success of your transformation vision? And we found here that um, advanced 67% significantly agreed they have the processes in place versus just 13% significantly agreeing at the early 
stage organizations. Another 42% moderately, which was great, but only 13% significantly. So this is a really important point. And again, um, one of the key focus areas for transformation and where we spend a lot of our time is looking at the re-engineering of processes. And that could be things such as how you brief your agency partners. It could be your data management process, how you're collecting, storing, analyzing data and turning it into insight. Um, it could be your audience development process for targeting your digital media. We would very much recommend each of the critical processes in your digital marketing plans are taken apart and thought about in terms of a way you can make them more agile and that you can empower your people to make decisions in a rapid uh, and quick way um, in terms of ways of working. This is a really important point. Next point was focusing on the time that it takes uh, pragmatism around how long it takes to transform the business. Um, and our point here was really um, the need to be realistic about the time it will take to transform your marketing um, and the need to invest in the time um, up front in setup to make sure that you are able to deliver lasting change. There's no point in a quick, uh, short, sharp program of change if that's not embedded in the business uh, as business as usual, uh, and certainly beyond um, a pure center of excellence alone. So looking at the numbers, we asked to what extent you agree or completely agree that you are pragmatic about the length of time required to implement and complete your transformation. 82% of advanced versus 46 of early stage. So again, a real difference here in um, the realism about the time it will take to drive um, the change. Uh, Jody Harris had uh, a great quote here uh, from um, the Global VP of Marketing Culture at AB InBev, and she said, marketing transformation success has to be measured in terms of commercial business results. Okay, that's the number one metric, um, but building that proof does take time, um, and you need to build that into your plans. So realism, another key point to bear in mind. Now, thinking about that point on uh, taking time. Um, I was, we were particularly staggered by the insight we saw here. Um, and this was a point about uh, whether or not the businesses, the organizations had a clear and concise roadmap in place that laid out precisely what needs to happen, uh, when, how, and by who within your organization. Do you have a clear roadmap in place? 82% of advanced businesses would agree but only 25% of early stage were agreeing that they had a roadmap in place, which um, really is very low. Uh, and again, one of focus areas for transformation in our opinion and in our experience is to spend the time at both the global level, um, but also within each of your priority market levels to create a roadmap that does identify the key actions, the key milestones and the key owners um, to put the uh, plan into place and to have the roadmap that steers everything that is happening across the business. Um, Paul Bennett from AXA, great quote here. Again, um, we would agree a critical enabler of success is having an aligned and actionable change roadmap with crystal clear objectives and KPIs. So very much something you have to have in place. Even if you've started on your journey, it's still worth going back if you don't have those roadmaps in place and putting in the time and effort as they really will steer you on the right path to change. The last area that I wanted to touch on was technology and data. Um, we asked the question here, to what extent your technology stack and architecture are fit for purpose, fit for marketing purposes. Um, as they have been designed based on business requirements and predefined use cases. And again, a, a real stark difference here between this being achieved in advanced organizations versus early stage. 100% um, of advanced were saying, yes, you know, we strongly agree or agree, we are fit for purpose because we're focused on business requirements. 
And that compared to only 42% um, of early stage, indeed 4% strongly agreeing at early stage. So it's very, very important that when you jump um, and you think about your technology stack, you really need to spend the time defining specifically what are the business requirements, what are the individual use cases. If we go back to that path to purchase point, what are the specific experiences that we want to deliver at every stage of our path to purchase? How will data, how will technology transform those use cases and customer experiences? That should then define your technology um, stack requirements, and that should form the RFP process that you would do to choose the right technology solution. Um, and those of you that have seen me present at, at numerous WFA forums will know my analogy and my picture of a, a crashed Ferrari, um, which is where, you know, in the past, we have seen a lot of organizations jump to that Ferrari tech stack solution without understanding um, how it's going to be used, where it's going to be used, having the capabilities in markets to use that Ferrari. Um, and of course, then it's not adopted uh, it, um, it proverbially crashes. So um, to have the right solution that is adopted, for us the number one KPI for tech, um, you need to make sure it's based on a deep understanding of business requirements. Next area um, was to focus in on data. And um, two points here. The first one was really around the need to develop a data strategy or at least data principles um, and a strategic framework that will drive how all of your markets and brand teams are collecting and using data. Um, we saw earlier how important data is and how it's moving very much into the marketing function. This question here, we looked at to what extent um, is customer data managed as a strategic asset um, in adding commercial value to the business? Um, somewhat encouraging that we have seen this um, increase compared to our uh, data-driven marketing reports from a number of years ago, but still too low when it is looked at at the early stage, um, 46% um, versus um, a very high 81% um, for advanced organizations, which is great to see, really are placing data as a strategic asset. Um, the other key point is then around the ability to turn that data into insight. And um, you'll see in the report numbers, we looked at to what proportion, what, um, what percentage of businesses have the process to turn data into insight. Um, and we found that nearly 72% of advanced organizations said, yes, we can turn data into insight compared to just 45% of early stage. So a really important process to crack is putting in place the skill sets um, and the processes to turn that data into insight. Um, a couple of our clients last year were, were recruiting two or three times as many data scientists and insight specialists into their marketing function as they were brand managers and marketing managers. So we're seeing a real focus for um, businesses increasing their skill sets in the area of data and analytics. So that covers the key recommendations and points that are coming out of the research. We just wanted to touch then on some of the key barriers to change. Um, and looking here, these were some of the key um, challenges with delivering a successful transformation. Um, and it was interesting, across the board, they were generally fairly common across the different stages of maturity. Um, but what was interesting is that they were relating largely to areas like having the right skills, overcoming traditional attitudes and beliefs, overcoming legacy processes. These were where the focus was um, uh, across the board. Um, very encouraging to see leadership alignment uh, actually one of the lower barriers, still in the 40s, but still one of the lower barriers, which was encouraging to see compared to where it used to be um, in the 70s and 80s uh, percent a couple of years ago. So that's, that's good to see. 
but very much interesting to see that it's about people, it's about attitudes, it's about process. Um, interesting point on the far right, you will see there the point about lacking the right technology, um, but only at the early stage. So um, those early stage businesses are still seeing tech as a key barrier, um, but uh, not as much as the people on the process side, which is encouraging to see. So before we jump over to some questions, a um, bit of a summary around what we've covered on the call this morning. Um, marketing transformation in the 2010s was really focused around digital and uh, well around around data and technology. That was a lot of the focus. And uh, McKinsey famously talked about 70% of transformation programs a number of years ago failing which accounted for 900 billion of the 1.3 trillion that was being spent on transformation being wasted, uh, which they called mismanagement on a colossal scale. We're starting to see that shift now um, and improve as we start to be able to address the people, the processes and the legacy structures that actually sit as barriers to change. Um, and the um, Harvard Business Review reported that those uh, transformation programs that focus on people and culture are five times more likely to succeed and deliver breakthrough performance than those that uh, neglect those areas. So the four pillars that we always think about when it comes to driving tangible change, number one is the pressure for change. So having a compelling reason that is recognized at the very top um, number two, that there is then alignment of that recognition right the way across the business and that there is a common view of how we're going to get to um, our vision for change. Number three, the resources being in place to drive the change. Um, the organisation needs to have the capacity, as we said earlier, to run the transformation, the people with the right skills, the right time to devote and the motivation to see that change through. Um, and finally, having in place that roadmap, the clear, actionable plan, so people know what is expected of them as individuals, what each person needs to do, uh, their role in the change that the leadership want, and of course, by when that needs to happen. Um, in the report, I won't cover this now, but in the report, you will see uh, a bit more detail where we elaborate on those pillars with um, a 10 step process that we would encourage you to uh, think about and uh, look through um, and just check off really which ones of these you have in place and which ones perhaps you need to go back um, and think about looking at again. Uh, I'd like to introduce now my colleague Andy Green who works alongside uh, myself in Dentsu Schema um, as one of our global client leads. Um, we'd like to move now to questions and answers, but I certainly hope that some of the insights that we've shared today have been of interest and been of use as you consider your programmes. The report will be released in the coming days and contains all of this information and a whole raft of other uh, insights and recommendations. So hopefully it will represent uh, a good and valuable read to all of you. Thanks, Nick. Um, that was fantastic. Very insightful indeed. I've seen it many times, but th there's lots more in there today. So thank you very much. Very interesting. I'm personally very Pleasure. interested in the evolution of, of marketing with these new disciplines coming up. Um, but mm. it's encouraging to see that advanced stage organizations aren't losing sight of the, the 4P fundamentals, pricing, product, and so on, which, um, as, you, as you mentioned, that would make Mark Ritson very happy indeed to see yes, that. Indeed. Um, so great, very interesting indeed. There, there have been some questions coming through. So why don't we, we go to those first of all. So first one, um, as digital becomes a mindset, how do you see the roles and responsibilities of digital specialists evolving in the organization? I'm not sure if that's for you or Andy. Uh, I can pick that one up if you like, Matt. Thanks. Um, I think what we've seen from many organizations um, is a clear progression. I think it goes for any topic um, that's new in a business. Um, and that is that you start off with um, isolated evangelists pushing a, a new idea um, and that coalesces into a, a center of excellence um, that is driving 
the process, um, which then spreads out and, uh, and moves into the markets and, uh, and across the organization, a sort of hub and spoke type model before eventually those skills starting to be in, be hired as specialist roles within the, the various departments. Um, and finally, the skills become integrated into the mainstream um, function that they're doing. So you don't have a shadow digital specialist, you have a an all-round integrated marketer that has the digital skill or that has the skills capable of, uh, of working across all channels. Interestingly, yeah, yeah. we're seeing less than 10% of organizations have reached that Nirvana stage. Yeah, I still think there's that's a great point, Andy. And I think there's still um, a huge need to have people with the um, expertise in place. I would encourage them to start looking at how they can engineer those sorts of roles into um, the core marketing teams, into brand teams, into um, uh, possibly thinking about moving into you know classic marketing management types of, of positions so that they can actually really instill their expertise into the day-to-day -day that needs to um, change um, in terms of marketing processes, marketing campaigns. One client we work with has recently um, taken what was their center of digital excellence and taken the people that were sat in that to be frank, silo, and put those people now into and across their multiple global brand teams and local brand teams in the various uh, priority markets. So they've taken what was a silo and, and embedded it into the business. So I can see that trend certainly increasing. Um, I think the more, too, that the digital specialists start to think about the language and the um, impact that they can bring into areas like broader topics like customer experience and um, journey mapping, um, the, the more strategic the conversation and useful the conversation that they can have is going to be in driving transformation. But uh, I think those people are still set for um, very many years of, of rude health when it comes to the need to have that skill set. That's good to hear. Okay, uh, next question. Actually, there's two which have got a linked theme here. It's about culture and sort of legacy. So we've got a specific question. Legacy structures can be the hardest ones to address and change, which I think we can all acknowledge. How best might an organization break down and, and tackle this? Yeah, I think um, you, you're absolutely right. They are um, incredibly difficult. I don't think there, there's an easy answer um, to um, breaking down um, the structures other than to, to break down um, the structure. I think you know, absolute clarity uh, around what success looks like um, and alignment um, with the, your, your customers in the sense of your business customers, the parts of the organization that you, that you support um, and gaining that agreement as to what it is that you're trying to achieve and what success will look like. Um, and then tackling it head on is, uh, is probably the best way to do it. And I, I know you mentioned, and how do we maintain business as usual um, whilst we're, we're going through there. Um, and uh, I think the, the challenge is that you know, clearly you, you have to um, deliver against the, the objectives uh, and the requirements that are placed on you or the program will derail. So taking enough time to do it properly, providing enough resource to actually um, enable it, recognizing that people working on the change you know, are generally the people that you know, are, are, are the ones that, um, that drive success, but giving them enough time and bandwidth um, to actually um, achieve that. And I think the the linked question to that was uh, was how do you um, how do you go about it um, in the sense of um, uh, you know how, how do you address traditional barriers and overcome those traditional barriers? And one of the things that we've seen is successful programs. There are always exceptions to this rule, but generally speaking, successful programs have somebody who has a grounding in the traditional offline world. Um, but obviously understands the new digital world leading it. 
where you have a digital native that's never worked in the traditional space, um, they find it much more difficult to understand and um, you know, recognize and reflect those legacy beliefs. Um, and um, they can actually um, run into a brick wall in terms of the, the resistance to the change amongst the traditionalists. Yeah, I just add to that. I think Andy's Andy's right about um, you know almost you know making some brave decisions. And one of our clients, eighteen months ago now, made um, what in on paper was a very simple move, but uh, was difficult, but was hugely impactful. Which was they took uh, three separate teams um, and they merged them into one unit. So they took the digital team, the digital center of excellence. They took their media center of excellence, their media function and team, and their CMI, their insights team, and merged them into one unit. Um, and what that did, they then looked at the various processes um, that, that they needed to work between them so that the insight team was who was in charge of the data um, and the insight development were able to work very closely then with the media team who were you know, previously not that focused on how they would develop the right audiences working with Insight. You were then working with the, the, the media team who then went about executing through you know, audience-centric buying and programmatic. And uh, Previously, those three areas or processes to get from data to execution were completely separate. And by merging the teams into one, they broke down those brick walls, they broke down those barriers, they speeded up um, the, the process of data to Insight and action. Um, and it made a transformational difference. Also, motivation culture-wise, it made a huge difference. So, you know, it, it will take some brave decisions, some changes in structure, reporting lines, um, and the like to get to where you need to get to. Yeah, well, that's what you've just described does sound quite brave, doesn't it? And actually, it might be hard for an organisation to identify those those moves. And there's a, there's a question here from a from a, an attendee that says, how can we develop a meaningful timeline if we've never done something like this before? And I think that's the point, isn't it? Some of the things you've just described are quite, well, you know, substantial and intimidating. And if you've never done something like that before, it might be hard to know. So, you know, can you speak a little bit to how you might, yeah. you might address this if you're doing it by yourself without a support of a consultant, you know, how, how would you, how would you bite that off? Okay, very, very flippantly, first of all, however long you think it's going to take, it's going to take twice as long. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I make no apology for being flippant in that way. Almost every organisation that we've been involved with um, has walked into this with an expectation to make meaningful change within a 12-month period. And yes, they can make meaningful change, but without exception, they're all still on the journey so um, you know, I think it's very important to recognize that if you're changing attitudes and beliefs, then you're talking multiple years. If you're changing simple processes and structures then, and technology, then you can probably do it in under a year. Um, so it, it's the, it's the mm. mindsets of people um, and they have to see Thing. So whatever you do, design your program in such a way that it regularly delivers tangible um, benefits. So you start to see small gains that will build and then sustain the momentum. And we would say target every hundred days, um, you know, so every quarter, um, you know, target to have something that's going to actually, um, you know, be, be, be a thing you can hold up and point to and say, see, it's starting to work. Yeah. You, you need a, you need quarterly wins. Um, you need to have a plan that there'll be some monstrous big changes that will that are multi-year, but there'll be things that are much more achievable and tangible in the short term. So structure your program in short, medium, long uh, term. And as Andy says, have those hundred-day plans which you structure with an agile approach, of course, that will deliver you regular wins. Um, otherwise, it becomes a hell of a slog to get to that end point. That's very helpful. Thank you for that. Okay, I think we've just got time for one very quick one. It's about in housing. And I, and I thought that we did see that in the report that there was a greater trend amongst those who are more advanced in their journey to be in housing more functions. So are we saying then that 
you know, your in-housing is, so there's a guarantee that the more sophisticated marketers or those who are more advanced on their marketing transformation journey are going to be in-housing? Or do you think there is, that that's not necessarily a sort of a firm link? You could be, you could be transforming, but not in-housing. And, and a linked uh, yeah. question to that, because we've got a, a specific question, if we can, we'll have to be quick in our answers. Um, change management tips uh, for, for in-housing production and creative. So quite a lot to answer in our last two minutes. <laughs> Go for it. Um, oh, God, I'll just quickly answer the first one or, or provide a thought on the first one. Um, yeah. The level of in-housing is is related to your the level of skill sets, uh, maturity, and processes that you have in place. It ultimately is. Having said that, it's not right for everybody, and um, the business needs to make a fundamental business case around why they want to in-house. Um, and you know, in-housing, you know, saying we're going to in-house on a Friday and trying to start everything on the Monday simply will not work. It won't. Um, you need that transition plan, you need that program of change to get there. Um, just understand what you're in housing, why, and build a plan to get to that end point. Um, it's not now, right I, for everybody. Yeah, I'd, I'd build on that, um, Nick, and, and particularly relating to the creative um, question, and that is co-creation with the people who are, whose uh, it actually affects. Um, you know, so many... Um, in-housing decisions and plans are created by ivory tower consultants um, who are divorced from the reality of the day-to-day -day. Um, and um, literally um, you know it looks great on paper but they overlook the, the human element and the the impact on um, you know the sustainability of the the skill sets the, the ongoing learning the diversity um, that they're buying from external providers, um, from their, their creative agencies. And, um, uh, and it's, it's something that you need to actually involve the people internally who will be responsible for the output um, and listen to what they say. Um, and that will smooth the process and ensure that you take them, take it in baby steps or eat the elephant one mouthful at a time. <laughs> Brilliant. Great. Well, look, there are more questions, but let's leave it there. Uh, thank you both very, very much indeed. I've really enjoyed working with you on the report. Um, it's been really great, and I'm looking forward to disseminating that to all our membership. And there's, there's loads in there for everyone. Thank you all members who joined us today. I really hope you found this useful. Please leave us feedback. It helps us understand what's working and what isn't. We will distribute this recording, this PPT, and the full report laden with recommendations to you today and um, we look forward to to working with you closely in in working sessions and forum meetings where we'll continue to unpack this theme thanks to you guys andy and nick thanks to everyone on the call have a fantastic day ahead thanks everyone